Uh, my name is Simon Brown. Doing this evening's presentation, we'll be finished before the president starts his sonar. And it being Durban, you'll all be home in plenty of time because everything is close in Durban as opposed to Gauteng, where you can pack a lunch and still not get there on time. Um, looking at trade, the trade wars, I'm going to start off by my disclaimer on this to say quite simply that this thing moves faster than I can update presentations. Um, I've had to change it three times just this week, uh, and things are happening at a fairly rapid rate. But this is the state of play right now. And there's a bunch of data there which comes out which has perhaps bigger issues, but we'll touch on those as and when we get there. And we go all the way back to the 1930s, uh, two set, uh, congressmen in the U.S. called Smoot and Hawley. And the reason they're important is that they started, they wanted to put some tariffs on two agricultural products, one of them being wool. Um, and by the time they'd finished the process, it was in excess of 6,000 agricultural products that Congress then voted to tariffs on. And that's because agriculture was struggling in the U.S. And then, of course, we went into the 30s, and of itself, a, a depression decade for the U.S., um, but what happened as a result of it was that suddenly it was the concerns around giving Congress too much power. So what they did was Congress was given power for trade treaties, not tariffs. And factoid, which will win you every bet you ever take, as it gets mentioned in the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off, which also has a famous architectural house in it. So like if ever you're in a random bar and you need free drinks, Smoot Hawley were in the movie. Um, but what came of it is they decided that Congress should not be allowed to do tariffs, that the President of the United States has full and unhindered ability to do tariffs. In other words, he can sign an executive order, any executive order, for whatever reason he wants, and he can impose tariffs on countries. So what Trump is doing right now is 100% totally within his remit. He's allowed to do it. And it goes back because Congress didn't do it well, so they gave it to the president. And we might, in time, with new administration, see this debate re uh, sort of invigorate itself and decide who actually has authority. At this point in time, Congress does uh, 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 trade deals, such as the replacement for NAFTA and all of those sort of things, and the president can impose tariffs as and when he sees fit. And uh, President Trump has seen fit and done dozens of them. So what's happening has president and certainly is well within, within, within rules and, and, and regulations within the U.S. So what are we looking at when we look at a tariff? We've got a custom charge at port of entry. Um, so a good is imported into the U.S. If it's coming, if it's a certain good from a certain location, it then has a additional charge added onto it. And that charge essentially goes to National Treasury. Basically, it is a tax, and it does go into the Treasury. But what it does is it's incre increasing costs to importers. Um, and that obviously ultimately gets passed on to end user. What we've seen so far with the first round of tariffs is that most of the goods that were being tariffed were then being were, were, were components of finished product. What we're looking at with the second round of tariffs that are being proposed, and I must stress, the second round, which Trump tweeted about a couple of months ago, hasn't yet been promulgated because there's processes that need to happen, and those processes are now nearing their conclusion, and those tariffs can effectively go into effect in the next couple of weeks. Uh, certainly by the end of June, they can start being in place. By mid-July, they will be totally in place. And the distinction is it's now going to be end-user products. So instead of being a silicon chip, as an example, it will now be an iPhone. Um, and that's going to have a, a bigger impact on the, on the end user and on the consumer. <clears throat> and ultimately, you know, makes no uh, total common sense, it pushes the costs of goods up. Now, tariffs in of themselves have been around forever and a day. Uh, you know, countries use tariffs to protect industries. Predominantly, they use tariffs as, as a mechanism, as Trump is doing, of, of to punish other, other, other economies and the like. They're not a new concept. What we thought as a planet, which we had largely worked it out via the World Trade Organization, and that's where uh, uh, treaties go through, trade treaties go through, uh, and tariffs get mediated slash litigated in a sense. Problem with the World Trade Organization is that at, the, at this point in time, it's just, it's, it's unable to function. Uh, it has an appeals court, but that court doesn't have enough judges. In order to replace judges, they need US approval, and the US is refusing to sign off. So the World Trade Organization right now is a completely void and toothless body. And we could debate whether it ever had teeth or not, but that, that's as an aside. 
right now it is unable to do anything because certainly in this point, what you know, if 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 Trump puts tra- tariffs on China, then China should go to the the World Trade Organization and say, "Hey, help us out." And at this point, you just don't bother because no one answers the phone at the WTO. Uh, that might in time change, but it means that a Trump has the legal might in terms of American law, uh, and at this point, in terms of international law, there's nothing really able to stop him from doing what he is. The tariffs at the moment are sitting at 10%. The new ones will come in at 25%. The current tariffs are $250 billion. New tariffs, which will come in the next few weeks, will be at an additional $300 billion. Uh, It was only $500 billion of imports from China. Now, that's a 2017 number. The 2018 number, they don't have an official number yet. They're estimating it at around $580 billion. What we are seeing, therefore, is that he, Trump is hitting a ceiling in terms of what he can place tariffs on, but of course he's not hitting a ceiling in terms of the percentage that he can charge. I mean, he can go from 25% to any number he likes. Uh, in terms of Chinese retaliation, uh, which is coming in at a lower percentage of mostly around 10%, um, they're putting tariffs on about $110 billion of U.S. goods coming in, and that's out of a total of $130 billion, that also a 2017 actual number. So they're both pretty much a capacity, but what we can see is the disconnect, that there's half a trillion going from China to America, <clears throat> and a sixth of a trillion, $130 billion going the other way. And that is, by and large, what Trump is complaining about. That is, of course, what global trade is about and how it works. And America is doing a lot more service uh, export, which they're exporting more to Europe than they are to China. Uh, China, interestingly, we would oftentimes still view it as a country that makes sort of cheap, low-quality knickknacks, and that was true back in the 70s, is no longer true whatsoever. China makes the effort. Uh, probably one of the most, I mean, you know, a, a top electronic device is made by Foxconn <clears throat> in China. Uh, the Huawei P, uh, Pro, what, Mate Pro P30 or something, probably the best phone in the world right now, is 100% Chinese made. So what, we, what we're seeing happening is that China is actually upskilled and therefore creating product which is in much larger demand into the U.S. That low quality, low cost production has shifted to other parts of Southeast Asia, Vietnam, uh, and and such territories as that. So it's still happening. It's just no longer happening in China. China has very purposely, and that's an important point that they've done it purposely, moved up that curve. And it was a decision that was taken by the, the Chinese Politburo, whatever they call themselves, in the 1980s to move away because they looked at you know, cheap, low quality, and they're like, Anyone can do this. What's our edge on this? Yeah, we've got cheap labor, but like, really, what's our edge here? So they moved up that curve. Um, and they've done it very, very successfully, <clears throat> as we can see, by half a trillion a year flowing from China into the U.S. And much of that half a trillion is electronics and product like that, whereas much of the $130 billion flowing to China is agriculture. What China is doing, interestingly, is they're lowering some tariffs with other trading partners. So they slap a tariff on goods they're sending to the U.S., so the U.S. doesn't want as much of them anymore. Uh, so what they then do is they remove the, or reduce the tariff to Japan or Europe, or and they're trying to balance it in that sense there, which America's not doing. And that's a, an important implication. I'm going to come back to it in more detail, so we'll park that there for now. Europe is on the list, but really at 808.5 billion pounds, it hardly matters. Uh, And those are still in abeyance. The process has been done, but it hasn't yet been implemented, and the talks are ongoing. So Europe has got potentials there, but it's not really a big issue at this point in time. Uh, It could become, but certainly not just yet. Mexico is not no longer a threat. Uh, two weeks ago it was, and then it wasn't, and it all comes via tweets. Mexico is an interesting beast. Firstly, the new NAFTA. So NAFTA was the uh, trade agreement from sort of early 90s, which uh, Bush number one did, North American Free Trade Agreement, being replaced by United States, Mexico, Canada Agreement. The names are hardly thrilling, but neither here nor there. The new agreement is... Pretty much it's the 1990s agreement, but updated for 2019. 
a lot of stuff that they actually mention in the NAFTA, like neither doesn't get made anymore. You know, I don't know. I'm trying to think of an example. Yo-yos. No one has yo-yos anymore. Um, and the youngsters don't know what a yo-yo is. So it's more than anything was an updated process. It's been agreed by the parties, but as per Smoot Hawley, it hasn't yet been signed by Congress. So the U.S. is still running on NAFTA. Uh, the countries need to sign. Mexico signed. Canada signed. Congress hasn't yet signed that agreement. Trade between the two countries is fairly significant. Uh, the U.S. sends almost $300 billion a year to Mexico and then brings in about $370 billion from Mexico. The complexity, though, is that this isn't just, you know, I don't know, sending Ford motor cars to Mexico and buying avocados and bringing them across the border. Uh, the, the Ford motor cars, as, as an example, can cross that border seven times whilst being manufactured. So it gets part of it done in the U.S. and then it gets shipped to Mexico where it gets, I don't know, uh, painted. And then it goes back to America and, and, and the, the brakes are added. And then it goes back to Mexico. Um, and this is particularly in agricultural products where, for example, you are a, 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 a uh, farmer. Uh, a, a beef farmer in, in, in Mexico or it's in Texas and you've got your beef but you send it to Mexico to have it slaughtered because it's really cheaper but then you take it back to America to have it cut because they're the experts but then you send it back to Mexico to have it uh, packaged because it's cheaper and then it gets sold into America and that cow's got like passport with more stamps than my passport. Um, <laughs> So the Mexico trade is complicated. What we saw, though, however, with 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 Mexico, and and that deal is now all everyone's happy now, um, is that President Trump is prepared to use tariffs as a tool to resolve other issues. This Mexico issue was not about unfair trade. China, he says, it's about unfair trade. With Mexico, it was about immigrants crossing the border. And what he's most worried about is actually immigrants coming through the southern border of Mexico, through the country, from Honduras and the like, uh, and then coming into America. Um, so that was his concern there, and he used tariffs. Now, he then claimed to have an agreement, and this is an agreement which, as the New York Times and Washington Post points out, was actually agreed upon in March, so it's not a new agreement. And then I don't know if you saw the, the video, he has a piece of paper which is a secret agreement which will be announced in time. Make of that what you will. But Two things. The first is no current issues with Mexico. The bigger issue is that President Trump is happy to use his executive authority on tariffs in areas beyond just what he considers unfair trade. And that is frankly terrifying. I, I mean, I, I remember when Obama came out last year to South Africa. Was it last year? Year before he came out for the Mandela speech. It was last year. Um, and I thought this was going to be great. And I was off and I went and saw him speak and everything was lacquer. And someone said to me, no, like, shh, don't let Trump know we exist. Like, if he's never heard of South Africa, that's a good thing. Um, and if Obama comes, now he knows about us. And now, you know, I don't know, maybe... Maybe President Ramaphosa says something tonight and Trump's not happy and we wake up tomorrow and we've got terrorists too. Um, we can argue, that, you know, certainly there's a debate to an argument to be had around the validity of terrorists, the purposes they serve, if they're ever any good, if they you know, do what they're supposed to do, we can debate that. But certainly moving them into a realm of basically settling scores left, right and center opens a can of worms which is unprecedented. I mean, let me rephrase that, unprecedented in the last couple of hundred years. Now, if you go back to 1500 Europe, then yes, this was absolutely how kings and queens, etc., uh, 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 rampaged across Europe. But certainly in more modern times, we are in uncharted water, which makes making you know, predictions or expectations or anything like that, frankly, nigh on impossible. But we will muddle on anyway and try. So what is the impact... <clears throat> that we are seeing so far in terms of the tariffs. So World Economic Forum looking at 2020 estimates, uh, they're expecting about almost half a trillion GDP to be at risk in terms of tariffs. That's larger than our economy. Uh, the expectation for reduction in GDP for 2020 purely based on tariffs with the available information that we have right now, and that is fluid and might change, uh, global GDP off by 0.7, US 0.4, China 0.9, and EU 0.8. 0.4 for the US is not that actual big an impact. I mean, so the last number came in at 3.2, but let's 
Yeah, a more long-term average for the U.S. in terms of GDP, probably around two-ish. Uh, if they dropped to one and a half, that's okay. Uh, if they're currently at three and they drop to around two and a half, that's okay. Um, global GDP of 0.7, that starts to hurt. The big one is China of 0.9. And the reason is quite simple, is that, you know, China was for decades plus points plus seven percent it's come down in recent years it's floating around the six and a half if they start to grow at five and a half percent that has significant implications part of those implications make no mistake is just expectation we have grown used to china growing at six and a half percent if it suddenly came in at five and a half percent traders around the world would panic rightly or wrongly, I mean, forget whether they're doing the right thing or the wrong thing, they would panic, they would hit the sore button, and it would be ugly. Europe is very ugly because 0 0.8 is about their current GDP. Europe hasn't yet recovered from the financial crisis of 08 09. Super Mario, otherwise known as uh, 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 Chairman Draghi, has commented that he's going back to what we colloquially call kitchen sink economics, which is quantitative easing infinity. He kind of took his foot off the pedal and decided not to. Um, German bonds are at minus 0 0.3. Take, I want to take a, a, a quick, a quick uh, 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 side pivot here for a moment. As a rule, how did a economy fight a recession? They would cut rates. Uh, and how did you manage inflation? You would use rates, either up or down, depending where inflation. If inflation is going up, you pull it down. If inflation, uh, you, you manage it with rates. Uh, and, and let's use the U.S. That worked perfectly fine when your rates were averaging around 4%. Lots of wiggle room. You're doing quarter percent cuts. You've got 16 cuts to zero. You've got 16 ra raises to, 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 to 8%. You've got wiggle room galore. But now we're in a situation where the U.S. rates are 2-ish percent. So if the U.S. goes into a nasty recession, they run out of wriggle room quite quickly. In other words, are we going to see negative U.S. rates in our lifetime? The answer is probably yes. And I understand what a negative rate is. When things are going great, you want return on your capital. When you're unsure, you want return of your capital. And right now, you give the German central bank money, and they give you back less, but at least they guarantee to give you back less, which is telling you that the world is not convinced by Europe right now. And, and Europe has struggled. What the quantitative easing the US did was they went aggressive, they went hard, and they went quickly. Um, and Europe didn't. I mean, Japan's the bigger example, which took 20 years to get aggressive and have never managed it. Um, Europe was just too late to the party, and, and, and there's reasons why, and they're not important. But a drop of 0.8 in Europe uh, puts them, I mean, there will be European countries in recession at that point, uh, some more than others, but 0 0.8 is about the average GDP growth that we're seeing uh, in the Eurozone right now, in the economic Eurozone right now. Those in of themselves standing alone, and if this was our only concern, and we looked at those numbers, and yeah, we could see how almost a percent drop in China would, would spook markets. We could see how 0.8 could perhaps see European economies in recession, but everything would more or less be okay, except that we are currently in an environment where the World Bank, IMF, and others are revising global GDP downwards. So that trend has been happening where GDP has been under pressure, and now what we're basically doing is just adding to that pressure. What I'm saying is if this was happening six or seven years ago, it would be less of a concern because those economies were doing stronger, the GDP numbers were expanding, IMF World Bank was typically looking for better GDP and upgrading data. At this point, they're in the process of downgrading data. And that perhaps is the biggest point here, is that we're – experiencing these trade wars in an environment which is an economic environment which is already I don't want to say fragile but like you, you you're treating it carefully you know, the, the, the US is currently experiencing their longest in duration and second biggest in terms of percentage bull market in the history of the of, of the US um, and it, you know, the, the, everything comes to an end. And at this point, that U.S. bull market is closer to the end than it is the beginning. Now, I don't know when it ends, but if it runs another 10 years, my statement is still true. But I wouldn't be putting money on that bull market necessarily another 10 years. So we're at 
that sort of stretched, sort of rarefied air. And we can stay in stretched, rarefied air for a long time. Greenspan's phrase, irrational exuberance, he made it to 1997. That market collapsed in 2000, four years later. So we can stay rarefied for a long time. This just doesn't help when you're already at rarefied levels. That's the trick. That, and that's, that's, that's the concern in that sense there. There are some obvious winners from it. We're seeing the other Southeast Asia economies, South Korea, Vietnam, Taiwan, as production moves out of China. So if you're producing widgets in China and a tariff gets stacked on you, well, move the widget production to Vietnam. Easier said than done. Yeah, there's costs in, ter in terms of, of, of that moving. That move was also, you don't just do it on a dime. You don't wake up on Monday and by Tuesday you're now in Vietnam. You, there, there's stuff, there's processes, there's things that's going to happen. It's going to take some time. For example, Foxconn has come out and said, you know what, we manufacture iPhones for America in China, but we have capacity in other factories and we could manufacture, I mean, they manufacture iPhones in India. So the Indian iPhones could go to America and the Chinese iPhones could go to South Africa or wherever the case may be. So there are ways around it. They're hacks, but also they're longer term. If you've moved your production to Vietnam for whatever reason and trade wars then become trade peace, you don't necessarily pop back to China. You're in Vietnam. It works. <clears throat> There's caveats. Are you getting as good a price? And are you getting as good a quality? And if you get yes to both of those, well, then you stay in Vietnam. Well, now you've got to learn Vietnamese instead of Mandarin, but yeah, you, you basically stay. So China, that's why China's trying to you know, drop tariffs and, and, and sort of respond back to stop losing the manufacturing. At this point, there's not a lot moving across borders, but it's still early days. These are processes. It, it is certainly starting to happen. And Foxconn has made the announcement. I think they made it on Monday, uh, where basically they said, yep, you know what? We can actually supply all of American iPhones from places other than China. You know, problem solved in that sense there. Uh, Kind of yes, maybe no, because some of the components of those iPhones will still be made in China, and you know it, it's the 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 supply the, the global logistic supply chains are are monster beasts and 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 are hugely complex processes, um, and it's not just you know oh, let's flip a switch and get it from there instead of here. There's a lot more to it. For example, uh, soya, which was uh, being bought hugely. The U.S. was selling humongous soybeans into the U.S. and now is not, and that has now gone to Brazil. So Brazil is having an absolute boom, and if you're a soybean farmer in Brazil, you are loving it. You are suddenly manna from heaven, and you wish you could produce more. That sort of thing, such as raw agricultural product, is much easier to shift between markets. You, know, you phone up a farmer in Brazil and say, you got soybean? Yeah, cool, send it. Tarasco, you find the American oak and the Brazilian oak and you make them fight for price and you have a better price, you ship it. You pay freight on board, Brazil, America, uh, not a huge level of difference. So that can swing. What you might see is that uh, soybean farmers in, in, in the U.S. might start planting cotton instead or maize or some whatever, planting something else. But farming is something that typically within a season you can swing your crop into something else. So you see a lot more uh, elasticity and movement happening in that space. So it's really the electronic side that becomes a lot more critical uh, as in the manufacturing as opposed to the agriculture. Um, inflation is... At this point, so, so inflation is undoubtedly a risk because basically we are paying more for the goods, left, right, and center. And maybe we don't pay more for the iPhone, but we're going to pay more for that one. It's going to filter its way through. What we have seen is globally is that inflation just remains immensely low. When the crisis happened and Ben Bernanke was flooding the market with quantitative easing, and I saw an interview on CNBC when he was asked about inflation, and they were like, hang on, you flood the markets with, with, with easy money. Uh, isn't that going to be inflationary? And his response was quite simple. Yes, it will be inflationary, but let's survive now and worry about that battle tomorrow. Except he was wrong. It wasn't inflationary. And the reason it wasn't inflationary is because where that, that, that money went – that money went into equities and bonds. And we can see that by equities elevated levels and bonds at negative yields. Remember, bonds yield up, price down. 
So what we see is that the money went more into investments rather than hard assets, such as you know, build a factory or, or, or plant soybean or whatever the case may be. It's where it went into. But tariffs ultimately hurt inflation. Um, inflation's not the worst thing in the world. And before you bite my head off for it, there's a point at which inflation is the worst thing in the world, hence a $100 trillion note. And I actually have that. That's my note sitting at home. Um, I have 10 of them, which makes me a quintillionaire in useless Zimbabwean dollars. Um, but what we have certainly seen is at certain inflations and fine. It's, I mean, our, our food retailers in South Africa are suffering by a lack of food inflation. Because everything's going up except the price. And so their costs are rising, but their revenue isn't, and they're being squeezed on margins. A bit of inflation is fine. And at this point, I, our global economy can take a bit of inflation. Certainly the U.S., they're looking to target around 2%. They've got a bit of a wiggle room there. Europe wouldn't mind some inflation. Japan would, would probably give you an emperor for some inflation. Um, in South Africa, 4.5 will stay right where we are if we can, please. Um, but that could put some pressure onto rates. And this is interesting because we obviously had the rate cut post 08 09, and, and then nothing happened for a long time. And then slowly we saw some rate increases in certain markets, the UK, US, but here, uh, Europe, no, Japan, no, uh, Australia, yes. But that pendulum has now swung. And we're expecting a rate cut next month. Uh, the US is expecting uh, four rate cuts over the next 12 months. Um, except, so suddenly that pendulum has swung. And why are they looking at rate cuts? Why is Jerome Powell and, and, and uh, 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 the Carney man in, in the UK, etc., cetera, uh, and our own governor looking at, at rate cuts? Quite simply, because they're saying this economy is a little rarefied and fragile. It goes back to my earlier point. And they're worried about a looming recession down the road. And as a central banker, you want to be ahead of the curve. So you start putting back on those rates, except there's just not much wriggle room. And you know, they can cut a bit, but at some point they hit zero. Now, we're away away from zero, but you know, at some point you just start running out of space. So if this goes really pear-shaped, we have some problems. We have inflation rising. And the reserve and the banks can't really do very much about it because they run out of space and because they're worried about the fragile economies. And they're suddenly like not sure what to do. Because when inflation goes up, what you do is you push rates up because that pulls money out of the economy. It pulls money out of the economy because if I'm offering you in America 8% interest on your cash, <clears throat> or I can take 8% in the market at risk, you put the money in cash. And then suddenly there's less money chasing goods, and therefore prices of goods come down. Except now we've got a need for cuts and a need for increases, and you can't do both. You've got to pick or choose. Bonds, flat to safety. Uh, we already have, and I actually heard the stat this morning on a podcast, and then I, it went in one ear, and it didn't even get halfway across the head before it disappeared. Um, we have trillions and trillions of dollars of bonds that are currently yielding negative rates. And these are not Venezuelan and Zimbabwean bonds. These are Sweden, Germany, et cetera, et cetera. Greek bonds. Remember Greece? Remember when the world was going to end because the Greece were going to default? Uh, their bonds were at 27%. Yeah, down to one and a half in some instances. Um, is that because Greece is not going to default? Well, maybe. But also, it's that flight to safety. And, and the reason is quite simple. Governments don't default on debt anymore. Now, that's so 1980s. Well, I mean, Argentina did in the early 2000s. But they don't default on debt anymore. Why? Because they own the printing press. And I know they print money, and that, that creates inflation and weakens their currency. But what does inflation and weaken your currency do? It lowers your debt because it becomes less valuable. So it's actually printing money is the easy way. Don't default on debt. Just print your way out of debt. Problem solved. I mean, not a painless process, but Argentina, who defaulted on their debt just 17 years ago, last year issued a 100-year debt bond, and it was 14 times oversubscribed. I mean, I don't know if an Argentina will be around in 100 years. I won't, but I'm also not buying a 100-year Argentinian bond. So what if we start to see concerns coming through, the flight to safety is you want return 
of your capital. So you go and buy T-bills or you go buy Bundes bills or whatever the case may be. And that, of course, then sends yields even lower which again, contradictory, because when I did the event uh, at Power Hour last year, Surviving the Bear, the trigger to watch for recessions is usually when U.S. yields get above sort of 4% and then you start to panic. Uh, but suddenly we just, I mean, and it was approaching. When I was doing that, we were hitting 3%, things were happening, and now we're back at around 2% as money just flows into bonds for that return of your capital. And in the case of American T-bills, you also get 2% money on top of it, which is... If you're not sure about things and someone promises you 2% and that promiser is the biggest economy in the world, you're probably going to take it. So we would potentially see some inflation coming through and we would potentially see bond, bond yields going even lower as we see the flight into bonds. Emerging markets are a mixed bunch. Um, as, as long as you can remain, <clears throat> as long as you don't get tweeted by the Twitterer, um, EMs are, are probably some winners, but also probably some losers, broadly probably more neutral. The easy winners are the soybean producers in South America, the, the, manufacturers, the, the uh, uh, manufacturers in Southeast Asia. Those are obvious easy winners, but they also have side impacts where they're going to start potentially having impacts coming through as well. Um, but running through, I mean, short answer is, is that there's no emerging market economy which stands out as in this economy is going to do brilliantly well. I, mean, I thought perhaps Vietnam, and I went down a deep, dark rabbit hole in Vietnam, uh, but Vietnam has other challenges. The most interesting is, <laughs> side note, but if you want to become a permanent resident of Vietnam, you have to declare that you are a communist. And I'm really interested how you prove that. Actually, I suppose you just quote uh, a communist manifesto at people. Um, I just thought that was really quaint. Like, I am a communist. It's like when you fly into the US and they say, are you a terrorist? Uh, no, definitely not a terrorist. The short answer is that the EMs are broadly beholden to the rest. I mean, if, 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 if America and, and China go full tongs at each other and they start having uh, uh, tough econ economies and uh, interest rate, uh, uh, GDP dropping and then perhaps as much as going into recession, et cetera, et cetera, the EMs are going to take the pain. We, we are unable to escape it. It's just that simple. We are an EM. In terms of the emerging market basket, we're probably higher up the list than than, than many. I mean, we think that we have challenges. And then I talk to you about countries such as Venezuela, such as Turkey, such as Russia, and suddenly our problems look like a walk in the park. I mean, we're not shooting journalists, we're not arresting professors, and uh, we're not turning the lights off for a week. We have challenges, but they're modest compared to many of our, of our fellow EM economies. I've been traveling, so I have no idea, and I have lights right now. And actually, I'm here for the sea, and you know what the sea doesn't need? <coughs> ESCOM. <laughs> South Africa in of itself. So I, 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 There was a lot of excitement around the steel industry. Uh, we don't have capacity. We struggle to compete because of high input costs, most notably ESCOM. Um, our steel industry has been largely decimated. Also, Arsenal Metal have not spent two red cents anywhere in the world on upgrading planting equipment, et cetera, et cetera. So they're really struggling. Um, I thought maybe some food. I thought we could send some sugar to some people, but we're a net importer. Uh, chickens, maybe we see some relief from chicken because we get a little less dumping coming through, but we don't, again, we're a net importer of it, so we're not going to be winning anywhere there. Gold and platinum, I'm going to come back to in a little more detail. Uh, petrol, maybe... I mean, oil has been down and the czar is stronger, but oil is really at this point playing to the Iran, Iranian story uh, and what's happening up in, in Gulf of Oman and that sort of story. The thing is, is that if the globe starts to slip into lower GDP and recessions, etc., oil price weakens. Of course, OPEC tries to fix that by cutting production. Easier said than done, but certainly possible. Uh, the czar is currently strengthening, but as we see in every other global financial crisis, uh, the czar can strengthen for a while, but when things go really pear-shaped with the rest of the world, our currency crashes. Simple reason, foreigners take money out. They take it back home. You know, you're a fund manager in New York, and you're feeling confident about the world. You'll put some money into South Africa. That strengthens our rand. When things start to look ugly, man, you want that money as close to home as possible. So you yank it out of South Africa and you go buy American Treasury debt.
Nice, simple, problem solved, easy. Um, so Zarwood we can, uh, th th there could be some long-term potential. And what I mean by that is that we could target certain industries. Yeah, for example, when <clears throat> uh, Mexico was perhaps going to get tariffed, one of the biggest exports from Mexico into the U.S. is avocados. And like, well, we grow avocados in Durban and in Pumalanga. We could ship some avocados over there. Of course, an avocado tree is five years to maturity. Um, now, my sister's garden has three avo trees, but I don't know that that's enough. Um, but if this was to be a long protracted battle, we could perhaps do something about it. However, I think right now we probably have our own challenges that are fixating our minds, and, and we're not quite, at, you know, as a country, uh, individual companies differently, but as a country, I think we're not quite there yet to say, whoa, opportunity, let's see what we can do. There is, however, an interesting space that is going to be, assuming that trade wars are happening, but we're not seeing global recession. What you want is insulated, isolated companies, and those are your SA Inks. So not sent over, because they're a global logistics company, uh, but a Kira or an Advertech who basically educates South African kids, a ShopRite or a Pick and Pay who basically sell food to South Africans. Of course, at this point, you're probably a very brave person to be buying SA Inc. There's an argument to be said that that's when you should be. Magnus Haystack, I can't believe I'm quoting Magnus Haystack, but what the heck. Actually, it wasn't his article. He just tweeted it. I take that back. Edited out the video. Um, Shenet had an article about South Africa is in the worst space economically since 1960. Something like that. Our economy is in the worst shape since 1960, which, of course, got lots of people deeply panicked. The contrarian in me is like, hmm. I mean, assuming we don't completely manage to destroy our economy, that what you're telling me we're the same value we were in 1960, that to me tells me that this is quite interesting and somewhat attractive and completely counterintuitive. But, you know, the point is to buy when everyone's panicking and to sell when everyone's going rah, rah. Very easy to say, less hard to do. But if things are, and if we go into global recession, there's very few places to, to hide <coughs> except food retailers. Not manufacturers, food retailers. 2008, top 40, 39 shares were red, one share was green for the year. ShopRite. Why? Because we've got to eat. And why? Because inflation went up, which gave them pricing power, which expanded their margins. And who are their biggest customers? Grant recipients. So ShopRite actually had a good tooth. It wasn't very green. It was up 10%. But the index was down 42. That's a 50% outperform. That is humongous. Absolutely humongous. So there might be some opportunity in proper, pure SA Inc. exposure. So, yes, I mean, so, so, so uh, I'm going to give you a longish but short answer to a, to a question. Short answer, yes, the new customs proposals are very, very advantageous. Uh, there might be some flip off that China is already coming into Africa and with maybe the U.S. cut off will get a little more aggressive then. We're going to come head to head with China and we will lose most times. Um, I also think that at this point, our government slash economy, I'm not sure that we are well positioned to take full uh, opportunity of that of that opportunity uh, it, it's a huge opportunity in essence it's customs free it's like a europe you know, ultimately the dream is a european union but in africa um there are significant challenges and the example i give you is this chap who was doing a, a, a nickel mine in in zambia and he's like it was, it was an example it wasn't a true story but like you've got a beautiful tarred road up to a border and on the other side you've got a mud track and it's getting the economies to talk to each other and engage each other and the like and i'm i think there's a lot of challenges there my bigger concern is that china is also looking at africa yeah yeah they're yeah. belt and road i guess it is but uh, you know, if we can start to get some of the benefits that europe got out of yeah it's yeah and, and and one of the so that's 
And and I think it's going to happen. And we've kind of had this conversation in a different way around CEOs before. I think it's going to be driven more by the shop rights of the world, who already have 20% revenue from the rest of the continent. NAMPAC, who've been spooked, but are there to a degree. Grinrod, who, if you looked at their rail exposure into the rest of the continent at one point, were the best exposure. And then they sold the rail business. Um, well, taken away from them. Um, but but I, I think it's going to be, I, I think our government, yes, but as is often the case, is that the CEOs are ahead of the, the government of politicians just because, I mean, politics is slow moving. And there are, there are companies already doing, and I think there will be more companies going into it. I mean, Advertech is looking at it. City Lodge is looking at the rest of the continent. And this is initiatives being driven from boards rather than, than, than from government. Government will... Yeah, uh, the 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 trade deal will make it easier for them, and and that will help them in the process. Yeah. So for the first time, I switched out of pick and pay into shop right at about two thousand and three, and for the first time since then, they're actually comparable businesses. And at this point, if you were to say which one to buy, I would say <sighs> shop right gives you a better operating margin, but other than that they broadly in the same space, whereas for the last 15 years, that has not been the case. It has been head and head. The, the key benefit, perhaps, that ShopRite has over pick and pay is that they've already got Africa exposure to a much larger degree, and they've done it organically. How? How tariffs will be affected if Trump doesn't see his next term next year? Yeah, I'm going to come to that in a second. So China's response is really quite simple. Trump has 581 more days in office, or maybe 2041, depending if he wins. Does Trump win next year? Toss a coin. In a two-horse race, and we've got to understand this, in every two-horse race, toss a coin. Whether it's Brexit, whether it's Trump and Clinton, whether it's Gore and 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 Bush, I, it, it, you know, these elections. I mean, uh, what Gore lost Florida by like what? 30 votes and therefore lost. Trump won against Hillary basically on about 80,000 votes out of a total combined, what, uh, 70 million or whatever it was that were cost. I mean, two horse races. And everyone blames the, the predictors. Understand that if you're doing a, 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 a model on, on a two horse race, your margin of error is 3.5%. So unless someone is romping home 55, 45, your margin of error is the margin of victory Toss a coin. I mean, is Trump there? Is he gone in 582 or 2042? No idea. Of course, who replaces Trump? Don't know either. I mean, is it a Republican? Is it a Democrat? Who is that Democrat? What I also think is that maybe Trump's just changing the game and maybe this is just how it goes forward. But China's response is really, really simple because that chap there is president of China for life. And he's like, what do you mean 2041 days, you amateur? I'm here till I die. And I eat rice. So I'm living forever. It's called punishment. You eat rice, you live forever. I'm allergic to rice. I hate it. The point being is China's playing the long game here because China can. Now, Trump is on record. He was asked a question about the economy in 2025, and he said, don't know, don't care, won't be president. Um, China's long game, and their long game is, well, hang on a second, look at this. We're getting like, we can't, okay, so why don't we make our own semiconductors? Why don't we set up industries? And remember, when China wants to set up an industry, they write a letter, and it happens. As opposed to, we want to set up an industry, and we can talk about it for 100 years, it, it may or may not happen. They're a command economy. They've got the space and the capability to do it, and they are patient and play the long game. I, I know folks who've tried to do business with China, went across, pitched a presentation, and did a five-year business plan, and at the end of it, they finished and excited, and the Chinese are like, five years? Like, like like when do we get to the real meat what do we you know what's your 10 and the chinese expected a 50 year business plan and the op was doing the pitch is like yeah but i'm 60 i'll be dead and china's like yeah so you'll be dead like what's the six you know where's the 50 year plan china plays the long game and that benefits them hugely trump's playing a 2041 day game and that hinders the U.S. just by the process of whether you like Trump or not, so irrelevant. It hinders you when one person's thinking six years ahead and one person is thinking 50. 
So it has, it has bigger implications, which are going to play out over the rest of our lives. They could try to weaken their currency. We're seeing a bit of that coming through already. Trump has already tweeted about taking the trade wars into the now currency wars. Of course, who does he complain to? The World Trade Organization. And well, hey, good luck with that. You've crippled it. But China can and is gently, gently, gently doing it a little bit. They basically peg the, the currency and they're slightly letting it weaken, which benefits them. A lot of talk around how they could withhold rare earth metals or rare earth minerals. Very importantly, they're not so rare. Much like iron ore, these things exist anywhere. You walk outside right now and scratch around in the dirt and you will have rare earth minerals. The trick is they're not viably able to produce them. There's just not high enough quantities. Most rare earth metals are a byproduct. But in the meantime, they can round trip them. In other words, China sells rare earths to Vietnam and Vietnam sells them to America. Or China says, hey guys, no rare earths and uh, we got no more cell phones. China's not going to do that. What has China's response been in this entire process? Very quiet, very meek, very much, you know what, dude? 2,041 days. We can outweigh you. China's not coming back with a big stick. Trump's waving his stick and he's bashing and he's banging and China's just like, cool, like this is not fun. I'm not enjoying this, but we'll come out of this smarter. One day you'll be gone and we'll still be here and we're going to be better for it. Uh, they hold a lot of treasury bonds. They could sell those. Total U.S. debt is $22 trillion. I can't even comprehend that number. And China's got about 1.13. It's actually the stats released on Monday, sorry, Thursday last week. It's dropped down to 1.11. Yes, China could withhold rare earth elements and cause absolute chaos. Yes, China could sell their entire $1.1 trillion, $1 trillion of debt. And it's only 5%, but it would hurt. Fortunately, China's not. And their response has been, as I said a moment ago, very much to say, yeah, let's, let's, you know, what, 2,041 days, we can outweigh you in a sense. So they've sold down a bit of their debt, but uh, th that number tends to fluctuate. And in fact, foreign government holding of U.S. Treasury bills peaked in April, declined, uh, sorry, peaked in March, declined in April and May, and has been edging a little bit lower. But really, it's at the roundings. And that could be because they're switching and they're buying up some gold. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for it. But what Critically, as China is not retaliating, because if they retaliated, then really, really, it gets very, very ugly. Huawei is really, really interesting, because this is, indicates the uncertainty and the difficulty of how to play this game. So Huawei has been banned by executive order from buying any products. Well, American companies are being banned from selling to the company. Um, and this is America, uh, China's largest tech firm, second biggest cell phone manufacturer in the world, and by any independent processor, their P20 and P30 are the best cell phones available and the best cameras out there. Um, so the reason was national security threat, the global security threat, right? 5G is coming. Uh, Huawei is the leader in 5G technology. What happens if the, all the, the connecting switches belong to Huawei and then one day because they now do software updates rather than hardware. They update them all, and everything that goes on 5G first goes to China. Is that possible? Yes. How do we know? Because the NSA did it. Remember the Snowden link leaks? When Snowden leaked stuff, what we discovered is that the NSA basically, as the cable went into uh, AT&T, they just tapped it a foot outside the door, and they read everything. So it's been done before, and it can be done again which in of itself is a terrifying thought. But the problem here is that first, Huawei gets banned because they're a security threat, and then Trump says, oh, but we could perhaps make them part of the trade deal. And either you're a security threat or you're not, which again, me, the, the biggest challenge here is lack of certainty. And that's the biggest threat is the lack of certainty. We simply don't know. If China can't do 5G, Ericsson and Nokia are the only two other global companies who can in any way provide the, 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 the infrastructure equipment that is needed. The, the, the US companies that used to do it have mostly sold their tech off or moved into new areas, no longer competing. Um, so it's Ericsson. And when you look at Nokia, it's not the... the Excuse me, it's not the phone company. They sold the phones off with the brand to somebody else. 
Nokia will make anything that turns a profit. I mean, they've literally they've made rubber boots at times in their life before. Our hope is the G20 meeting next week in Japan. Uh, Trump, 10 days ago, was tweeting that if he didn't get to meet uh, Xi Jinping, uh, then he would, like, I don't know, push a button or something. Uh, reports are that they are scheduled to meet uh, on the sidelines of the meeting and that they will talk trade peace. I don't, I mean, I, I, I'm stating facts here because I have no idea what to speculate what will happen from those talks. But what, I, but in essence, and this is broadly Trump's game, and let's take the Mexico example, where he went completely Madonna crazy, threatened uh, terrorists, etc., etc. Uh, the terrorists were due on Monday, uh, uh, 12 o'clock New York morning time, and at 4.30 on the Friday afternoon, he's like, ah, oh, we've got an agreement, everything's good, no terrorists, and that agreement comes from March. When I was a kid, we called them bullies. Now we call them presidents. What it does mean is that there's a real chance. Let me take that back. There's a coin flip chance, because who knows? There's a coin flip chance that Trump comes back from the G20 saying, Xi Jinping gave me everything I wanted, and I've won, and tariffs are done. And man, we are off. If that happens, we are off to the races like you can't believe. If something moves, buy it. If it moves a second time, buy more of it. Because we are off to the races. Of course, he might say that and then five minutes later, some. but if we can get trade peace at the G20, we're off to the races. Let me put it the other way. If we don't get trade peace at the G20, it means that Trump and Xi Jinping are unable to find a meeting of minds, which means 2,041 days until there's a new president. So it's ugly and it's hurting. So I use this data. This is from Bloomberg. The reason I'm using this data is that Bloomberg has been updating this data since about 2010. In other words, they haven't now, in the panic of trade wars, gone and found data to find. They, this is stuff they have been doing for a long time. It tracks uh, Port of LA, which is 40% of world containers. Singapore, which is busiest by volume. Hong Kong, which is the North Asia, North Asia transfer unit. Uh, Baltic Dry Index, I don't much have faith in that. But what you will see, look at the top one up here. There's only one on the positive side of average. There's a bunch on the negative side. There's only two in the red, but the bulk are sitting down on the wrong end of that zero. Make no mistake about it. And if we look at those numbers, some such as LA is lumpy. Others are definitely trending, and those trends are not grand. Uh, here we've got, so same at the top, we've got German expectations, U.S. new exports, China new exports, and Singapore electronics. And again, that trend is coming down. Those are monthly updates. Now, is this trade wars, or is this a global economy slowing? And does it matter which it is? Now, I would posit it's both. I think our global economy is stretched, and in that little bit of rarefied. And as I said, we can spend there a long time. I think that coupled with trade wars is making for all of those dots being on, except for one, being on the wrong side of zero. And, and maybe if there was no trade wars, that picture would look exactly the same. Truthfully, that doesn't matter. I mean, it, it, it looks, it's, this is not a terrifying picture. But it's not a hotly convincing picture either, which is perhaps the best point, which is uh, let's not panic. In fact, let's never, pa panic doesn't work. Panic is terrible. So where do we hide? For investors, cash, that's our new five rand coin designed by Lady Scully coming out in August. I think it's cool. Um, I hate going to cash because the problem with cash is I always get my timing wrong. I incur costs. I incur tax implications. I am typically always invested. Also, it's absolute versus relative. Do you want to outperform? So absolute return is you always want to return above zero. Relative return is you just want to beat the market. And if market's down 20 and you're down five, that's called winning. It doesn't feel like it, but it's called winning. So for me, cash is, you know, I've always got money coming in from dividends, from monthly deposits, and I'm pretty much always just spending it. I just, I, I invest. And it's partly also my risk profile. I've got time on my side. I don't have dependents. Man, hoid in the market. And if all goes pear-shaped, I'll come live in one of your houses by the beach. <laughs> Yokes all off. <laughs> um, 
But here's what we do do, avoid tech. So research coming out, and there's different varies of it. The numbers are more or less the same. U.S. equity revenue exposure to China, 14%. Tech stocks are the ones that are going to get hit hardest, and they're also the ones that have run the most. This is, and this is uh, December 07, so I took it to pre-crisis just to really flatten that, to, to sort of flatten it out to Jan. Uh, annualized return on the NASDAQ is 13, on the S&P is 8% total return. So we've seen the tech stocks have run the hardest and are the most rarefied air, and the tech stocks are the most exposed to the trade wars. So they're the ones that are going to get hurt. Now, yes, Apple can start selling you Indian iPhones, etc., and maybe instead of 14, it's 10 or whatever. You know, let's halve it and call it 7. Tech stocks globally are going to be the ones that take the most pain because of that rarefied air. Um, I'm not going to delve into that, but that's just the, the splits between it. Interestingly enough, Amazon is a consumer services company. So you look at tech, and this is consumer service. Uh, that's consumer services. That's tech. Whereas here, that's tech, and that's consumer services. NASDAQ is way heavy tech. Tech has run. Tech is most at threat. So where do we hide? The bottom half. Consumer staples, utilities, diversifieds, insurance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, I'm not saying that they're not going to feel the pain. What we're looking for is less pain. And what I don't want to do is move to cash. I want to be in the market so that if it doesn't happen and we're off to the races, well, we've got a horse, a pony in the race. And then if things do go horrible, well, okay, we're going to perhaps, you know, trade wars or not, we're brushing our teeth, right? Uh, you're supposed to all say right at that point. <laughs> um, so we want to go into those more defensive stocks. What are the more defensive stocks? So it turns out by total dint of fate, we have an ETF which is brilliantly positioned. It's the, it's the core shares global dividend aristocrat ETF. We think it therefore aims for high dividends. No, dividends is the quality metric. For to be a US stock, you need 25 years of continuous dividend payments. That excludes Apple because they were nearly bankrupt 25 years ago, excludes Google, because they didn't exist 25 years ago, excludes Amazon, because they were nearly bankrupt 25 years ago, does include Microsoft, does include IBM. So it does have tech. But if we look at the breakdown of it, on the right-hand side here, where are my information technology at 5%? What have we got? Some real estate. We've got some financials, consumer uh, staples, industrials. We've got the ones that sat at the bottom half. So what I've been doing, every month I have a debit order that pings off and buys me ETFs. And I've been buying the Ashburton 1200. As of next month will be July, it will ping off and it will buy me the GlowDiv. And if I'm wrong and it's off to the races and it's peace in our time, excellent, lovely. I've still got a great stock, and it's a rand hedge, et cetera, et cetera. And if it all goes horribly pear-shaped, and, 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 and Trump and Xi Jinping end up with fisticuffs in Japan, well, I've got some nice defensive. Commodities? No, because if things go pear-shaped and the Chinese economy loses 1% of GDP, who do you think is buying all our commodities? It's been China. And if they're suddenly only growing at five and a half, it ain't China no more. The exception, gold. Uh, I, it's moved to gold. I don't know. We're not even, so we used to be the biggest in the world. We're no longer biggest in, in, in Africa. At this rate, Lesotho is going to mine more gold than we do. And, and that's, you know, it's quite simple. We've been mining gold for 140 years. When you start mining gold, you start with the easy stuff. We're now 4Ks down. Uh, Ghana has got gold where you like we had 140 years ago. Okay, you got jungles to get through. Once you're through the jungle, the gold is easy. Um, I, I, yeah, and my argument is, so Joburg was built as a city of gold. Now that the gold is gone, can we please close Joburg down and all come to Durban? I mean, just asking for a friend, hey? Gold, sure. I mean, gold is. I, I, I just don't play gold because I don't get it. I don't understand it. My wedding ring is platinum. Um, I mean, gold is currently having an absolute tear. And that's thanks to Iran. I mean, the thing is with, with, with gold is it'll run, 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 run. But when the crunch really comes, it falls. Why? Liquidity squeeze. 
In 08, 09, in 2008, gold went down. Why? Because what happened was is that you're a fund manager and you've got too much leverage and now you're getting margin calls and you've got to sell something. You don't want to sell something that's been decimated. Oh, gold hasn't been. So you hit it. So things, correlations, there are levels of correlation between assets and bonds and equities and commodities. And when the crisis comes, they all correlated down. The whole idea, equities and bonds are uncorrelated, is true until 2008, 2009. Equities and gold is uncorrelated, and that's true until 2008, 2009. When the stuff gets real, everything goes down. We're too hard for traders. Same old, same old. Stick to your strategy, obey your stops. Don't, because of this presentation, rush out and short everything you can see. You have a plan, you have a strategy, stick to it. When you get stopped, exit, wait for the next entry. Nothing changes. What's important here to understand is that truthfully, economics and cycles play out slowly. However, stock markets, news cycles, and presidential tweets come at you at high speed. So whereas two weeks ago the world was ending, suddenly two weeks later we're at... Uh, uh, the U.S., when I last checked, was yo far away from all-time highs. We're almost at all-time highs, and it's as if there's no worries in the world anymore. That's all well and good, but that doesn't change. The stock market isn't the economy. The stock market pretends to try and reflect it. Truthfully, the stock market is reflecting our fears, hopes, and nightmares more than anything else. So it might look like everything's great into the races, and then suddenly reality hits home because we get a GDP number from China or the US or Germany, that's just an absolute horror show. And then suddenly we are not. In essence, what this is is opportunity. Now, there are two things. You've got to decide what you agree or don't agree with what I've spoken about, how you plan to position yourself, and what happens at the G20. And then you've got to decide if you believe in what happened at the G20. I know. No one ever said this was easy. Um, without, world, without, without trade peace, this global economy is going to hurt. And if it happened five years ago, it would hurt less. At this point in 2019, trade walls are going to hurt. And simple as that. Uh, because of overstretched meetings. That meeting is 28, 29. That is next Friday, Saturday. We'll see how that goes. So by Monday week, July, we should be off to the races or not. Top of cycle event is what's worried. Very careful tech and commodities. I'm not selling anything. I'm already light on tech. I don't own NASDAQ. Um, <clears throat> I buy the Ashburton 1200. Why do I buy the Ashburton 1200? Because it's massively diverse and it doesn't have any deep overexposure to tech or any of the other sectors which might cause me pain and horror. Um, cash going into Glowdiv and then SA Inc. And I mentioned SA Inc. and I mentioned it's for the brave. <laughs> the trick is I've been talking the SA Inc. story now for two years, three years. Man, I got so much SA Inc. stock they offering me directorships on boards. Um, and some of them are working better than others. Hello, Capitech. Others are working less good than others. Hello, Santova. Well, no, no, Santova is not SA Inc. Um, but the rules remain the same by the quality. The, the ones that, I mean, to me, the, the easy ones are food retailers, those sort of things, education stocks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but of course, with the proviso that if, if the rest of the global economy starts falling off cliffs, man, we're just following it. Like, we, we can't hide. But if the rest of the global economy can muddle along and find some sort of semblance of something in the midst of trade wars, then perhaps we, you know, my biggest fear is that we're at the point, I mean, our market is up 13% year to date. It's the best start to a year since 2013. Um, and then if this all happens, you know, we're just at that point where our market's ready to finally give us a bull market and Trump and Xi Jinping are going to kill it for us. And that's just unfortunate. I mean, there's nothing we can do about it, really. I mean, don't blow up Air Force One, whatever you do. So, and it's just, SA Inc. is a hiding place. I've got plenty. I'm buying Glowdiv as of first Monday in July when my debit goes off. 
Of course, you could just do nothing, especially with your ETFs. The key point is investing is long-term. Long-term involves trade wars. It involves market crashes. It involves recessions. It involves all of those type of things. And we should broadly have a strategy which manages to consume those and work through them. One of the points, of course, being very important is understand your risk profile. What I mean by that, if you are approximately four minutes away from needing to live off the portfolio, you want a very low risk profile. If you're 10, 15, 20 plus years away from, then from living off your portfolio, high risk portfolio, of course. And during that period, chaos will happen. So my first crash was crash of 87. I bought shares on the Thursday and the market crashed on Tuesday. And I thought, excellent, that's it. My crash is done, never again. Then we had 98, then we had 01, then we had 2008. Crash has come. You know what's happened with every crash, with one exception, is we recover and carry on going. The exception, Japan. And that is a whole scary story on its own, so let's leave Japan to where they are. Japan stock market peaked in 1980s at 40,000, now it's 20,000. We don't mention Japan. It's like the, the uncle in the corner. We, we try not to mention Japan. There's a case to be made to say if your portfolio is well positioned, this type of event is what it is positioned for. Lawyers? Uh, you mean them going off to Amsterdam? So NASPAS, the default is you will receive new co-shares, one for one, uh, and you will have a CGT event because your NASPAS will be deemed to be sold. So if you've made profit on it, you have a CGT event. If you elect not to, and that's the default, if you elect not to, you, re you retain your CGT, your NASPAS, and you get an extra 0.3 NASPAS per one held. That will come in at zero expense, so it will knock your cost down, and you'll have a bigger CG attempt when you, event when you sell. The short answer is, is that you can either get NUCO, which is NASPAS X South Africa, or you can keep NASPAS, who will no longer have the X South Africa assets, but will own 73% of NUCO. Broadly, it's going to be the same. My expectation, and I'm touching whatever I think can be good luck for me, is that this should be positive to NASPAS. I'm expecting perhaps as much as 20%, maybe even more, to close that gap. Uh, the gap being the discount to 10 cent. The big benefit of the Amsterdam shares is that they're offshore and they're fungible. In other words, you could sell your new codes in Amsterdam, Except you can't, because Tita Mboweni won't let you, and the Reserve Bank won't let you. But technically, it is a fungible share. I exchange control regulations mean that you can't. But it is a Amsterdam traded share. So my advice to folks is to uh, elect to retain the NASPATH shares, because you delay the CGT event. Other than that, I see it as net neutral. <coughs> Mm. Property stocks, but uh, property stocks mostly they thrive when the economy is growing. Economy is not growing, and people are not spending. And um, this, this Peter Moyo, Peter Moyo, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's almost the same as the, the Alexander Yeah. So the good news about the Peter Moyo is it's not an operational issue. So it, it's not that he was taking money or doing anything dodge or not. It, it's non-operational. So it's moot to old mutual. Except, of course, they need a CEO. Property is interesting. There are two metrics you use for buying property. One, you want to buy at or around net asset value. And two, you want to buy when the yield is higher than the government bond yield. Uh, and currently, those are both in play for the first time in some 15 odd years. In other words, property is cheap. To your point, uh, the shopping centers are empty. Property stocks are struggling. Lease negotiations are going poorly. Uh, loan to 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 value ratios are deteriorating and there's a lot of bad stuff out there and some of the property stocks are going to really find it tough going forward. I, however, like to buy when there's blood on the floor. So I've been buying property. Now I'll state that at property is currently lower than every price I've paid. In other words, I buy and it falls and I buy and it falls and I buy and it falls and I buy the ETFs, either Satrix property or the PropTrax 10, which core shares is going to change into a new ETF in Augustish. Um, but I'm looking at this and saying, this is a nice value. I'm not saying it's a bottom and it certainly isn't, but I'm saying my, the attraction of property is that it's physical and it's there. And yes, some of them are bad properties and some of them 
will lose tenants and some of them will close down in terms of shopping centers and the like, but we're buying it at a price we couldn't buy it in the last 15 years. Um, typically what we do is we buy when everyone's excited and rah-rah. So you say the picture's bleak. It absolutely is. The bleak picture means I want to buy. What you've got to believe is that the bleakness will one day leave and we will see, for want of a phrase, the new dawn. Uh, if the bleakness is all that's left for the history of this country, then you don't want to touch anything. I, I'm a believer that at some point we will look back and think, oh, look at that. That was so cheap. Uh, so I'm buying. And I buy in property, I buy the ETFs just simply because I don't know enough about individuals. I like high prop, I like growth point, but I'm not smart enough about property. So I just buy the ETF, Satrix Pro or the PropTrax 10. Mm -hmm. way of tapping off information. I mean, in a way, this really requires us to start thinking way outside the box and to recognize that if information is such an asset, then, then stop worrying about it. Rather, allow a change in attitude towards information, which is like has been done in open source product, uh, development of computer systems, software, platforms, things like that. The developers have earned nothing from them, yeah. but they've got other ways of making the money. Yeah. Way of Red Hat sold for how many billion to Microsoft, and they sell free software. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So, but what have they done? They have now discounted the premium that people pay for private information. And that's exactly what Huawei and AT&T yeah. Who are risking in this 5G thing. So if we all go open source, nobody kids a damn thing yeah. about the information. And the trick with open source is that it's verifiable by my, you know, can China do something with their with their Huawei? Sure. But if it was open source, no, because we've all got access to it. So I do two things. I lock down my information like there's no tomorrow. I turn my GPS off unless I'm calling an Uber, and I'm paranoid. And my phone is encrypted and everything else. And then my home server, my NAS server at home, is 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 is, is, is a, a, a Unix box. I mean, because it's just open source. And my 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 security, the the firewalls I have, and that sort of thing, are all open source because that to me has become the safest place to be, um, is to use open source. Because if there are, you know, open source means there are literally, I don't know, tens, hundreds of thousands of of people way smarter than me, constantly checking and improving, and updating and making it better. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And what I'm waiting for, and maybe this is what Huawei would do, because they've been doing a new operating system for their mobile phones since 2012, is a open source OS. Now, technically Android is, but not quite. Uh, Apple is completely not. But a proper, I mean, Tizen was supposed to be it, and and uh, I mean, it was Samsung from five years ago. It didn't work. But I agree with you. Yeah, but it takes a, it'll take a mindset change. Yes. You know, at the moment. All of us are terribly possessive about our own information. And, and I'm involved in companies where we've got an open source platform and we just say to them, that's it, you can, you, you can use it. You can, that, there's the code again. And they don't understand, they get terrified. They say, no, no, if we're going to use your service, then we want you to set up a separate branch just for us so that it's... So that Proprietary and... You say, guys, yeah. you haven't got it. And, and 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 20 years ago, open source was buggy and nerdy, and me and my friends used to play with it, and it was great fun, and it never worked smoothly. 20 years on, it absolutely works. Yeah. Ladies and gents, I will park it there. Let's hope that Japan goes well. Failing which, 2,041 days. Thank you very much for your time. Peace. Mm. You said we're off to the races. <laughs>